Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you, and welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. We're glad you could join us for this Family Bible Study Hour. We're in the book of Numbers in our last lecture. Uh, we had just covered the priestly or ironic blessings. And you know, that's the way with God. He will bless you, but it's recorded throughout His Word. There are conditions. That little word, if, I-F, can be a very big word sometimes. And He will bless you if you do things His way. Today, we're going to look at a prime example of what happens when you don't do things God's way. And as you recall, in the first six chapters, we've spent a great deal of time with God putting things in order or organizing Israel to move into the land of Canaan, the promised land. And we've just gotten to chapter 7. Chapter 7 covers the uh, dedication of the sanctuary or dedication of the altar, if you prefer, uh, by the 12 pri uh, tribe princes. So with, we'll ask that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. We ask that you open ears, open eyes. Father, give us wisdom in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Book of Numbers, chapter 7, verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass on the day that Moses had fully set up the tabernacle and had anointed it and sanctified it and all the instruments thereof, both the altar and all the vessels thereof, and had anointed them and sanctified them, and, you know, we're talking about a, a lot that had to be done on the part of Moses and those that were helping him. Uh, if you start in Exodus chapter 25, uh, following on through the next several chapters, uh, the instructions that God gave on what the Ark of the Covenant was to be constructed of, and the size that it was supposed to be. Then it goes into the table of the showbread, uh, the menorah, and all of the things, the vessels, everything was in an orderly fashion. Verse 2, And the princes of Israel, heads of the house of their fathers, who were the princes of the tribes, and were over them that were numbered, offered. Now these princes are the same as the captains that were appointed by God in chapter 1 of this book of Numbers. And they were indeed assigned to help Moses and Aaron with the numbering or this numbering of the children of Israel. Verse 3, and they brought their offerings before the Lord, six covered wagons and twelve oxen, a wagon for two of the princes and for each one an ox. And they brought them before the tabernacle. Now this wagons, uh, the wagon for two of the princes simply meant that uh, the cost of the, the one wagon was defrayed or split between two of the tribe princes and then each prince gave an ox. By the way, these weren't the only ox that were dedicated. Uh, uh, to the altar, or the, the others were sacrificed, exactly. But these particular oxen were to be assigned for work, as we will see in the next few verses. Verse 4, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take it of them, that they may be, to, may be to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And thou shalt give them unto the Levites, to every man according to his service. Now, what this is referring to, and actually the only Levites that were, you'll see in a moment that are given wagons are the Gershonites and the Merariites. Uh, but what this is saying is that we're gonna, you are to divvy up the wagons and the oxen that are going to be used to carry parts of the tabernacle uh, according to the work that has to be done. Verse 6, And Moses took the wagons and the oxen, and gave them unto the Levites. And again, those were only given to the Gershonites and Merariites. Seven, two wagons and four oxen he gave unto the sons of Gershon, according to their service. And as we covered in verse uh, chapter four, the service of the Gershonites was to take down and transport and put back up the coverings, the curtains. Uh, again, you might think of it that the Merariites put up the basic structure, the boards and the uh, pillars of the sanctuary, and then the Gershonites were responsible for the tent material that covered uh, the uh, pillars and the boards. 
and uh, then also the curtains were also the responsibility of the Gershonites. And I remind you that was not, though, the veil that uh, separated the uh, uh, tabernacle of the congregation, excuse me, the, the area, the court of the congregation from the Holy of Holies. Verse 8, And four wagons and eight oxen he gave unto the sons of Merari, according unto their service under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And as you'll recall, the Merariites, as I mentioned just a second ago, were responsible for the boards and the pillars. So the heavier items, that tri the division of the tribe, the Merariites, received four wagons and eight oxen, the Gershonites, two wagons and four oxen. Verse 9, But unto the sons of Kohath he gave none, because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them was that they should bear upon their shoulders. And this word shoulders could be translated arm, but again, they were responsible for the uh, items that were found in the Holy of Holies, such as the Ark of the Covenant, the table of the showbread, the menorah, and all the vessels that were uh, in that service. And as where you recall, or you may recall in previous lectures, and then in the book of Exodus 20, uh, chapter 25, it tells that when you make these items, the uh, Ark of the Covenant, the table of the showbread, that these are to have loops on the ends of them. And through these uh, staves or poles, you might want to call them, made out of shittim wood and uh, then in, in, uh, covered with gold, uh, were used to carry these particular items. And as I mentioned, I want to give you a prime example of what happens if you don't do things God's way. And we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 6 at this point. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And there was a point that the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, this uh, happened shortly after the sons of Eli, who were priests, desecrated the sanctuary. You'll recall in uh, 1 Samuel, I believe it is, chapter 2, the sons of Eli were the crooked priests that would take flesh hooks and dump them into the boiling pot of a sacrifice and take more than what they were supposed to, ripping off the people. Uh, what happened then after the desecration of the sanctuary, the Philistines uh, defeated Israel rather soundly and captured the Ark of the Covenant uh, and kept it more or less as a trophy uh, of their victory over the people of God. Uh, the only problem is that also was the dwelling of God. Uh, the Philistines took the uh, Ark of the Covenant to Ashdod, and they put it in the house of Dagon, which was their deity. The next morning, they went into the house of Dagon, the priest of Dagon, and as you recall, the uh, deity Dagon was flat on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. They set Dagon back up, the next night came and rolled around to the next morning. They went into the, the uh, house of Dagon, the priest did, and Dagon was laying face down in front of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. This time his head broken off and his arms broken off. Well, and besides that, the land was being, this is all recorded if you're not familiar with it, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, you might want to make a note of that, but then uh, the land was struck, it says, but in later verses it follows along that the fields weren't producing crops and all of the people uh, were struck with emeralds, emeralds being hemorrhoids. And then they decided, well, we don't want this Ark of the Covenant here in Ashdod, so they moved it to Gath. And then worse happened to the people in Gath, those that weren't uh, suffering from one thing or another, or, or the land becoming totally desolate to where they didn't have any food to eat, they were also struck with emeralds. They decided they didn't want it in Gath, so then they took it to Ekron, and the punishment that God put on each of these became increasingly, increasingly more severe. The more that they rebelled against uh, or refused to return the Ark of the Covenant to Israel where it belonged, the punishment got more severe. Those, some of those people were struck dead, and those that weren't struck dead uh, also got emeralds. So 
It took the Philistines about seven months to figure out that this Ark of the Covenant was something that they didn't need to have in their country. And uh, I guess that probably happened after a lot of them not being able to sit down for a while. But what they did then, they got their priests together and said, well, we've got to return this Ark of the Covenant to Israel. How should we do it? And the reason I'm going through this long explanation is I want you to catch this very clearly. They made up trespass offerings made out of gold, five, and the five being one for each of the princes of the Philistine, of which there were five at the time. They made up five golden emeralds and five golden mice because the land had been struck uh, to the point by mice that it was destroying the crops. They didn't have food to eat. Then they placed the Ark of the Covenant, don't miss this, on a new cart, and they re returned it then to uh, inside the borders of Israel, a town called Beth Shemesh, in uh, which the, on the new cart it was sitting. They just left the cart there. Uh, the people of Beth Shemesh were so overjoyed that they, to see the Ark of the Covenant that they uh, immediately started fires and burnt the animals they were working with the fields as offerings to God. The Levites, who of all people should have known better, took the Ark of the Covenant off of the cart and allowed the people to be looking on it. And 50,000 plus were struck dead by the Lord at that point. But don't forget the fact that the Philistines brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel on a new cart. So we're going to pick it up in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. And I want you to recall this is a prime example of what happens when you don't do things God's way. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And this word chosen uh, might be better translated selected. First Chronicles chapter 13 makes a better record of this event. And when I say better record, what I mean in verse 2, it makes it clear it wasn't just 30,000 selected soldiers. It was the, among this 30,000 people were heads of tribes, heads of households, priests, and Levites. And all of these were gathered to go to get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it to Jerusalem, which David had set up as the capital of Israel. Verse 2, And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from uh, Baale, that is also the same as Kerjath jerim as is recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 6, of Judah, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And don't forget either that the Ark of the Covenant had some very sacred contents in it. It contained the two tablets that had the Ten Commandments on it, the law that Moses received on the uh, mount. It had also the manna in it, and it also, at this time, I'm saying, and they had these items. It also had the rod of Aaron in it. And this all would have been happening around 1043 B.C., by the way. Verse 3, And they set the Ark of God upon a what? Upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. Now Abinadab is mentioned in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7 along about verse 1, I believe it starts, as the man that after 50,000 were killed in Beth Shemesh, they didn't know what to do with the ark. They were afraid if it came to our place, people would die or get hemorrhoids. So they left it with Abinadab, which it's not clear whether he was a Levite, but I think he most likely was a Levite. Who else would you leave the Ark of the Covenant with? But it stayed at his house for 20 years. But here comes David and all the troops, the heads of the households, the Levites and the priests to fetch the Ark of the Covenant. In the house of Abinadab and was in Gibeah, and Uzzah, which means strength, and Ahio, which means brotherly, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And rather than drave, it would probably be better for you to imagine Uzzah uh, is walking along beside the cart. Ohio, or Ohio, is in the lead of the cart, as we'll see in verse 4. But again, they had Levites with them that should have known that you don't move the Ark of the Covenant on a new cart. So... I guess they thought, you know, after all, because the, the most recent moving of this had been by the Philistines, basically. They brought it to Beth Shemesh, so they're taking church lessons 
from heathen people rather than doing things God's way. Verse 4, And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, this being the Ark of the Covenant, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the Ark of, of God. And Ahio went before the Ark. And I'm sure this all looked very religious and very pious. I'm sure they all had their best robes on and, and playing church. Verse 5, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on coronets and on cymbals. And, you know, I'm sure David thought, surely the Lord would be pleased at this. I mean, we have a new cart for a very special occasion. We brought out all these dignitaries, the heads of the households, the heads of the tribes, the priests and the Levites. We have the band struck up and playing. Would God be pleased? Verse 6. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. Uh, it's translated in 1 Chronicles 13, and I think this should be that the oxen stumbled. In other words, the cart was shaken considerably, and the ark was about to fall off. What happened next? Verse 7. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, I imagine he was pretty hot at some of the other dignitaries that were there, including David as well. And God smote him there for his error. This word error better translated rashness. And it wasn't only he that was rash, though. As I said, it was the, the whole group that was there was pretty rash. And there he died by the ark of God. So we can see, you know, discipline, I think, is what we can get out of numbers as well as trust in God. It, when you have this number of people that are moving into a new land, you have to have order, you have to have discipline. And I think another thing that we can take from this lesson is to watch out for new religions. They were taking it upon themselves and following what the heathen did, the Philistines, in transporting the ark on a new cart when they had the law that told them exactly how the ark of the covenant should have been uh, led, uh, moved, I should say. And I'll point back to you too, these things, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, these things happened as a warning to you, uh, the people and me and myself, the people of this generation, the, the generation of the fig tree. So with that, let's go back to Numbers chapter 7, verse 10. Again, the point being, do things God's way, you receive blessings, you don't, and bad things are going to happen. And boy, did we just get started on the bad things as we work our way through the book of Numbers. Verse 10 of chapter 7. And the princes offered for dedicating of the altar in the day that it was anointed, even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And as we'll see, the offerings were made actually over a 12-day period uh, due to the number of sacrifices that were offered, it would have been uh, impossible to for the priest, uh, or, or let alone the size of the uh, sanctuary, the inner court, the outer court, I should say, to contain this number of sacrifices. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, They shall offer their offering, each prince, on his day, for the dedicating of the altar. And verse 12, and he that offered his offering the first day was Nashon, the son of Amenadab of the tribe of Judah. And Nashon uh, is the seed line through which David would be born, the seed line through which Christ would be born. Verse 13, and his offering was one silver charger. Now a charger is a shallow vessel. You might think of it something like a serving tray with a small lip around the edge of it and this would have been used for containing water or blood and uh, was also used for uh, the uh, fine flour mingled with oil. The weight thereof was 130 shekels, and this is estimated in uh, American weight of four and a half pounds, so that's quite a, quite a bit of silver. One silver bowl, now this would have been a sacrificial bowl, of 70 shekels after the shekel of, a of the sanctuary, and I'll remind you there was also a shekel of the king, but this was ordered by the shekel of the sanctuary. Both of them were full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering. And 
there are uh, seven holy offerings, three of which are considered holy. The thank offering, the firstborn, and the first fruits are considered holy, and then four offerings of the holy offerings are considered most holy, those being the uh, incense, showbread, sin, and trespass, and the meat offering. So those were considered the most holy. Verse 14, one spoon of ten shekels of gold full of incense. And this was, of course, incense that would have been burned in the golden altar of incense for the incense. Fifteen, one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for a burnt offering. Sixteen, one kid of the goats for a sin offering. Seventeen, for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of Nashon, the son of Amenadab. Now, if you multiply that times 12 tribes, that's a total of 21 animals uh, from each tribe. So times 12, you come up with a total of 252 animals. And as I said earlier, these then were offered each prince on his day, meaning we started with Judah, which, by the way, that's the same order. Uh, di the different places in the Bible, the tribes are listed in different order. And does that have any meaning? I think in some cases it does. In this particular case, it's the same order that the tribes present their dedicatory off uh, offerings to the altar as the ordering for the camps or the army, if you will. But um, again, of these 252 dedications, 36 of them, the whole animal and plus parts of the fat from the other animals would have had to have been, the 216 remaining would have had to have been offered on the altar fire. So that just was not possible to accomplish in one day. And I'm certain that that's the reason that this was uh, spread out over a 12-day period. But the remaining princes, and again, I'll remind you that these are the captains that were selected by God to help with the numbering. Uh, Moses and Aaron were instructed to accomplish in chapter 1. But the rest of the princes offered the exact same items. So uh, in the interest of time and, and not reading, the only part of this that changes is the name of each of the captains. So. We're going to uh, go over to chapter uh, verse 84 in Numbers chapter 7 at this point, and this then gives us a total of the 12 princes. These are the total of the offerings for the altar. This was the dedication of the altar in the day when it was anointed by the princes of Israel, and that actually the uh, uh, altar was anointed by Moses. The dedicatory gifts were given by the princes by the princes of Israel, 12 chargers of silver, 12 silver bowls, 12 spoons of gold. And uh, the spoon of gold were all filled with incense, and the charger and the bowls were filled with uh, fine flour mingled with oil. 85, each charger of silver weighing 130, that remember that's four and a half pounds, shekels, each bowl 70, and all the silver vessels weighed 2,400 shekels after the shekel of the sanctuary. And that, in any way you want to look at it, was a lot of silver and a lot of gold. 86, the golden spoons were 12, full of incense, weighing 10 shekels apiece after the shekel of the sanctuary. All the gold of the spoons was 120 shekels. Now, that's a lot of gold and silver here, and you might ask, well, these people were in captivity just a year and one month ago. Where did all this gold and silver come from that these princes dedicated? And I'll point out to you Exodus chapter 12, 35 and 36, just prior to leaving Egypt, uh, the Israelites were instructed to, uh, I won't say take, I think the word is even in the King James is borrow, but after all, they had been in bondage to the Egyptians for over 400 years. And this instruction was given to them by God to take this uh, from the Egyptians. And the Egyptians not only gave them gold and silver, but also raiment, as it's recorded in Exodus chapter 12. 87, all the oxen for the burnt offering were 12 bullocks, the rams 12, the lambs of the first year 12, with their meat offering, 
and the kids of the goats for sin offering, 12. Do you know what 12 is in biblical numerics? Well, that means governmental perfection. So again, here we see the order and the organization that God expects his children, his army, I'll go so far as to say, to follow. And the spiritual perfection, it's throughout the Bible. You know, there were 12 patriarchs, uh, there were 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 disciples in the New Testament. There were 12 apostles in the New Testament. So there you, you see the uh, spiritual uh, governmental perfection that God is sealing this with. 88, and all the oxen for the sacrifice of the peace offerings were 20 and 4 bullocks. 24 in biblical numerics is the priesthood. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, it's recorded that there are 24 elders that are around the throne of God. The ram 60, the he goats 60, the lambs of the first year 60, this was the dedication of the altar after that it was anointed. And again, 252 animals in all sacrificed to dedicate the altar. 89, and when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, this him here should be translated the Lord or Yahweh, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the Ark of Testimony, same as the Ark of the Covenant, from between the two cherubims, and he spake unto him. And I doesn't record what was said there, but I would imagine that Yahweh was expressing uh, his gratitude to Moses that the uh, 12 princes had uh, been so generous in their offerings. Uh, the wagons and the oxen were mentioned first, and I think probably a priority in that they were getting ready to move out, and these would be needed by the Levites. But so goes the dedication of the altar. In chapter 8, uh, we cover some of the laws for the priests. And verse 1 through 4 are restatements, actually, if you will, or clarifications of earlier instructions that were given to Aaron. So chapter 8, book of Numbers, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron. And I'll mention, too, that in verse 1, where it says the Lord spake unto Moses, this became a problem uh, for Miriam and uh, Aaron in chapter 12, as we'll see, uh, when they decided that uh, God shouldn't be talking to Moses alone, that they were important enough that he should be speaking with them more often. We'll see what happens. Verse 2, Speak unto Aaron and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. And what we're talking about here, of course, is the menorah, uh, Exodus chapter 25, 31, this is more or less a repeat or a clarification of that. But this, the, the uh, lamps or the candlestick menorah were to be placed on the south side of the sanctuary where it would better light the Holy of Holies, the interior of it, rather than the entrance for which someone might be coming in, which better be a high priest or there would probably be a death about to happen. Verse 3. And Aaron did so, he lighted the lamps thereof over against the candlestick, as the Lord commanded Moses. For, and this work, the menorah, speaking of, of the candlestick, was of beaten gold. And what this means is that it was made out of one solid piece. Unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work, according unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses, so he made the candlestick. And now in verses 5 through 14, we pick up the cleansing of the Levites. Uh, you recall in chapter 4, the Levites were numbered for redemption. Back up, I should say, chapter 3, the Levites were numbered for redemption purposes, and now they are about to be cleansed for service in the sanctuary. Verse 5, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, and I'll point out that he's already consecrated the priests at this time, this being Aaron and his two sons in Leviticus chapter 8, verses 1 through 9, covers that consecration. So the, my point, the consecration of the priest is different from the cleansing or purifying, if you will, of the Levites. 6. 
Take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them. Seven, and thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. Now this word cleanse here in the Hebrew is tov, hair, and it means to purify or Levitically uh, uncontaminated. Sprinkle water of purifying. Now this word purifying, uh, uh, some people have to wrestle with it a little bit. Um, uh, there are some scholars that say that this means sin water, that this word purifying is sin. Uh, but if you look in your Strong's Concordance uh, at this particular reference, and you'll notice that there's an asterisk uh, next to the Strong's Hebrew number. And what this asterisk means, as most of you probably know, is that the American and the English uh, revised versions of the Bible were translated differently. Um, and they translated it expiated. And, and I like to think of it that, that the water was for a cleansing. After all, the water today that cleanses is what? And that's, of course, the living water, Jesus Christ. Upon them, and let them shave all their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. So here we have an outwardly purification of the Levites, and I'd like to point out, too, how remarkably similar this cleansing is to that of one that has been supposedly cleansed, or the cleansing procedure for a leper, as recorded in Leviticus chapter 14, 8, and 9. You might check those out, and it's remarkably uh, close. Verse 8, Then let them take a young bullock with his meat offering, even fine flour mingled with oil, and another young bullock shalt thou take for a sin offering. And in the previous verses, we saw the outward cleansing of the Levites. Now we see the inward cleansing. And thou shalt bring the Levites before the tabernacle, and actually to enter the court would be a better translation, of the congregation, and thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together. And I think this probably rather than the whole assembly uh, of the children of Israel would have been impractical to get the over two million entire members of the congregation into the court. So I think probably this is in reference to the tribal heads, the family heads, and the purpose of them being there, of course, is to witness uh, what is about to happen. Verse 10, And thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord, and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites. Now, what this is symbolic of is that the, the children of Israel, or actually these tribe heads, are uh, turning these over or releasing the Levites into the service of God. Verse 11, And Aaron shall offer, this word means wave, the Levites before the Lord for an offering, and this better translated, a wave offering, of the children of Israel, that they may execute the service of the Lord. And again, this is all symbolic of the Levites uh, being turned over to the service of the Lord. And as you recall, uh, this the Levites were taken in place of, or instead of, the firstborn of the sons of Israel. So uh, you see some relation there, too, to the fact that uh, the people the con of the congregation are releasing this particular portion of the tribe to serve in the tabernacle. Verse 12, And the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks, and thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for the Levites. Now this laying their hands upon the head of the bullock was symbolic that they were sacrificing, the, this bullock was a representative of themselves, and they were sacrificing themselves to the service of the sanctuary. And again, now they're outwardly cleansed and they're inward, or inwardly cleansed. And I'll point out to you 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I think this is a, a good second witness to that, where Paul teaches that we have two bodies. Not only was it necessary for the Levites to be outwardly cleansed, the flesh man, it was important that they be inwardly cleansed, the spiritual man. I think Paul refers to them as a body terrestrial and a body celestial. And so you might check that out. But Verse 13, And thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron, 
and before his sons and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. The wave offering once again, the, the portion given to God. Verse 14, Thus shalt thou separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levite shall be mine. And God claimed the Levites back in chapter 3 when we had the numbering of the Levites from one month old and upwards, you may recall, and he exchanged the Levites head for head with the firstborn of the other tribes of Israel, uh, claiming the Levites before his own. 15. And after that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering. Verse 16, For they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel, instead, or in the place of, such as open every womb, even instead of the firstborn of all the children of Israel have I taken them unto me. And this word given, if you would you have a guess as to what that is in the Hebrew? Well, you might not be surprised, those of you who have studied any length of time, to know that that word in the Hebrew is nethanim, uh, given. And it's not to be confused uh, with the nethanim that we find in Joshua uh, chapter 9, who were a defeated people, defeated by the Israelites, and some of them, the captives, were given, that's the word nethanim, to the priest uh, to help in and around the work of the sanctuary. And they were to help chop wood and haul water, uh, no doubt things that the Levites normally would have done, but unfortunately the priests and the Levites became so lazy uh, in their uh, attention to the tabernacle that by the time of Ezra, uh, when they were coming out of the Babylonian captivity and returning to Jerusalem, you may recall Ezra said, wait a minute, let's do a head count here and see how many Levites we have, how many priests do we have, and come to find out they didn't have any all he had was a bunch of Nethanim who decided, well, chopping wood and hauling water is great, but uh, I kind of like the looks of these fancy robes, and they just flat took over uh, the work that the priests normally would do. Verse 17, For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, both man and beast, on the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. I separated them for myself. And again, the exchange made, I think, uh, probably things were more orderly with around the, in and around the sanctuary with one family uh, dedicated to the service of the tabernacle than if you had uh, the firstborn of all the other tribes coming in and then having, if you know, if a young man is raised his entire life uh, observing what the, his elders are doing uh, in and around uh, the religious aspects, it's going to rub off on him. And he understands it from a younger age than if he's just brought in all of a sudden and exposed to it for the first time. And also the Levites chosen by God because of the way that they zealously stood up for him when Moses came down off of Mount Sinai and the children of Israel had made a golden calf to worship it rather than worshiping uh, Yahweh, the, the, the God of heaven and earth. And Moses was furious. He said, who will stand with me on the side of God? And the Levites picked up their swords and fell in behind Moses. And God saw that and said, that's the kind of people I want uh, with me. Uh, are you the kind of people that God wants with him? I, I, I know many of you are. You've got a destiny and, and you're going to serve him uh, well. Verse uh, 19. Uh, 18, and I have taken the Levites for all the firstborn of the children of Israel, head for head of the man. You might remember there were uh, 273 more firstborn 
of the tribes of people of Israel, the firstborn, and they had to be redeemed at five shekels of silver for each one. And God also took the cattle of the Levites in exchange for the firstborn of the cattle of all the other 12 tribes. Verse 19, and I have given the Levites as a gift, here we go again uh, with given, uh, Nethanim, to Aaron and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come nigh unto the sanctuary to make sure that a plague that originated with God didn't come upon them for not following his instructions. And that was the job of the Levites. Many of them was to teach the people uh, what is the proper way to worship uh, our Father and uh, how do we behave ourselves in and around the sanctuary and uh, in order, all orderly and disciplined is my point, no confusion, uh, God leaving nothing to chance as he prepared his children to move into the promised land. Verse 20, And Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according unto all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did the children of Israel unto them. So far, uh, they're doing a pretty good job of following instructions. Uh, will that continue? Well, we'll see as we work our way through this book. 21, and the Levites were purified, and they washed their clothes, and Aaron offered them as an offering, a wave offering, before the Lord. And Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them with the sin offering uh, and the burnt offering to cleanse the inner man. And you know, we all have two bodies. Uh, uh, Paul teaches very well in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we have a terrestrial body and we have a celestial body. We have a flesh body, in other words, and we have a spiritual body. And I like that in this chapter, uh, we see attention given to both the out outer man, the flesh man, in the cleansing or purifying of the Levites, as well as the inner man. Verse 22, And after that went the Levites in to do their service in the tabernacle, of the congregation before Aaron and before his sons, that being Eleazar and Ithamar. You may recall Eleazar, the Kohathites, uh, directly responsible to him. The Gershonites and the Merarites uh, reported directly to Ithamar. As the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. Again, following instructions so far, 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, verse 24, This is it that belongeth, or pertains to, we could translate, unto the Levites. From twenty and five years old and upward, they shall go in to wait, and check out this word, it's to war, the warfare, upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And that's just how the Lord looked at it. These were members of his army, God's army, to war, the warfare of the service of the tabernacle. Now, in earlier verses, uh, chapter, which is in chapter 4, verse 3, uh, Moses and the princes of the twelve tribes were instructed to number the Levites from first uh, one month old and upward. Then they numbered them from the age of 30 through 50, you may recall. And here it states 25, and a lot of scholars wrestle with this. Uh, Bullinger, I'll agree with him and his comments on this, that they were numbered from the age of 30 to 50, but actually they entered into the service 
at 25 on maybe like a probation, you could think of it. An apprenticeship would be a good word to think of it. And, you know, they had to learn what it was that they were to do before they were numbered as active members of the Levites. Some scholars try and uh, uh, explain this away by saying that, uh, well, you know, the heavy laborious work around the sanctuary of cutting wood and hauling water, and then when they had to move the tabernacle from place to place, uh, it took a 30-year-old to be man enough to, to meet that requirements of that. And I don't know about the rest of you men, but uh, I feel like when I was 25, I was ever a bit the man, if not a little bit uh, stronger at the age of 25 than I was at the age of 30, uh, be that as it may, 25. And from the age of 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and shall serve no more, and no more to do the laborious work of cutting wood or hauling water for the sacrifices. You know, you think about the, the animals that were sacrificed, that took a lot of firewood on the altar to keep it burning continually, which it was to be kept burning continually, obviously, unless they were taking it down and preparing it to move to another location. But uh, that took a lot of wood. And then, too, uh, you had to have water to wash the different sacrifices, and that had to be hauled. And sometimes they had, you know, they're out in the desert here. So uh, hauling the water might entail a pretty good little journey uh, to the closest creek, as we say here in Arkansas. Verse 26, But shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge, and shall do no service, thou shalt, thus shalt thou do unto the Levites, touching their charge or touching their, concerning their responsibilities. And I think what these last few verses mean is that uh, certainly you would need uh, older Levites who were very knowledgeable and experienced about what it was that they were to do. So I think that they probably continued to minister with their brothers in and around the tabernacle. Uh, you could think of maybe in a, a supervisory role, uh, but not partaking of the, the arduous uh, labor that often went with some of the tasks uh, pertaining to the temple. Now, the age that the Levites were numbered would change uh, at a later point in time. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 23, uh, at the direction of God, David began to number the Levites from the age of 20 years old. And it's thought that at that time the temple was about to be built, in which case no longer would the Mosaic Tabernacle have to be moved from location to location. And they would be in or near Jerusalem uh, on Mount Zion, and therefore there wasn't as much as hard a work as what it was when they were moving from encampment to encampment, uh, moving toward the promised land. Again, last minute instructions preparing the people to uh, head out for the promised land. Chapter 9, we're going to see laws for the people, and we're going to see some additional information concerning the Passover. Let's get started a few verses. I'm about to run out of time, my point, but we'll get a few verses here in chapter 9, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the desert near Mount Sinai, in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, and this is just, you know, right at one year uh, after they came out of Egypt, uh, the, the Exodus often known as. The entire book of Leviticus and up to chapter 10, verse 10 of uh, Numbers is a period of time from the first day of the first month of the second year that they came out of Egypt 
to the 20th day of the second month. So barely a 50 day period for the entire book of Leviticus and up through chapter 10, verse 10 of Numbers, which is when uh, Israel will pick up and move, start moving toward the promised land. Verse 2, let the children of Israel also keep the Passover at his appointed season. And this is to clarify uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 25, where God instructed that the Passover, once Israel arrived in the promised land, they were to keep the Passover. So uh, the question came up among the elders and the priests and the Levites to Moses, well, uh, are we supposed to keep the Passover before we get to the promised land? And here they are being instructed, you will keep the Passover in the appointed season. And of course, the first month, uh, the 15th day, you count 14 days from the first day, which was the, the spring equinox, and uh, evening would be the Passover. Three, in the 14th day of this month, the first month, which is Abib on the Hebrew calendar, at even ye shall keep it in his appointed season according to all the rites of it and according to all the ceremonies thereof shall ye keep. Don't uh, postpone the Passover is the message until you get to the promised land. Well, number one, they'd have had a long wait because there's going to be a little matter of uh, 39 years plus a few months, uh, almost 40 years that the uh, people will wander around in the desert. And that's a good place to stop. We'll come back. And, and not only did there are the people of Israel instructed to keep the Passover as they make their way toward the Promised Land, there's also going to be some additional information concerning the supplemental Passover uh, in the event that someone was unclean and able to participate in the Passover at its appointed season. We'll cover that in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Ezra and Nehemiah. These two books are necessary to understand the returning to the Father in that sense of the example set forth in the end times of the rebuilding of God's most favorite place on earth. Also, within these two books, you find the hidden secret, hidden from most people's eyes, that the study in the Hebrew and the Chaldee that is given in these particular books will teach you how that the priesthood itself became polluted during this period of time, this is to say about 400 years before Christ walked the earth to the time that he did walk, instructing you very wisely, setting the example of how it is that we gather back to Christ himself. Ezra and Nehemiah, fantastic. You'll enjoy them. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the United States, and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, uh, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Uh, if you're listening by shortwave radio or the studying by the internet uh, somewhere in the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual uh, denomination or organization. We teach God's Word in a positive format here at the chapel. Uh, destroying others or tearing down others with negative serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, uh, correcting, and healing, fully capable of all three. You've got a prayer request, you can do it at the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need paper and pencil or a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Now, there are instances in God's Word where the people forsook Him, and then obviously He has feelings and emotions, 
and therefore he forsook them. So don't ever think that you know you can treat him any way you want to, meaning treating him badly or forgetting about him completely and then expecting him to be there for you, especially when trouble arrives. That's not the way it works. You know, it's a two, two-way street, just like any relationship in a family. It's a two-way street. And uh, he's, you know, your relationship with your father, the point I'm trying to make here, beloved, is depends on you, not on him. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he will be the same tomorrow. So uh, your relationship that you have with him, it all depends on you. It's, it's yeah, in your ballpark. And we do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these. They have needs in their families, troubled relationships, addictions to drugs, alcohol, Father. You know their needs. If it is thy will, a special blessing on each one of these. Watch over guide, direct, touch, heal, in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, and amen, and thank you, Father. First up today, questions. I got Jim in Tennessee. Uh, God told one of the prophets to put the deed to Israel in a clay jar and bury it. Where can I find this in the Bible? You'll find that in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, oh, it's that, almost that whole chapter concerns that subject, but pick it up, Jeremiah uh, 32 verses 6 through 25, uh, Jeremiah was the prophet that you're referring to who was instructed uh, to buy the piece of property, and he took the deed and put it in an earthen vessel and gave it to his scribe Baruch. Uh, to bury, and most likely that earthen jar with the deed to that property is probably still uh, buried in that location. Uh, will it be uh, discovered? Boy, wouldn't that be quite a discovery. I, I think it will be unearthed, though, uh, when Jesus comes back and is with us during the millennium. Uh, Inel in California. I thought I read in the Bible we are to tithe 10% of our earnings, but most churches say we must give 10% of our gross income. Does it really say gross income in the Bible, meaning before taxes? I am on fixed income, and if I give my church 10%, I won't have enough money for food and housing. And I know, first of all, let me say, your father is very intelligent. And he would not want you to uh, make contributions or tithes to uh, his church if you were going hungry or if you didn't have enough money to pay for the prescriptions and, and medications that you need to stay healthy. Um, and these people who say 10% of gross, uh, you know, I don't know where they're getting that. That's not what God's Word said. T a tithe simply means 10%. And to me, if you're going to, let's say you're capable of tithing, you're, you tithe 10% of what you have. If the government takes 25% uh, of what you earn, you don't have that anymore. The government has that. So uh, the, the tithing in the Bible, the way it worked was, let's say a man raised cattle. And what happened would, he'd take his staff, and as someone drove the cattle by him, he would count. And every tenth animal was to be dedicated or given to the sanctuary as a tithe, 10%. And he wasn't to look and see which one was a good one and which one was a bad one because that was a real bad sin. And whichever one that tenth number fell on, that was the one that went for the tithe. Now, if he had to give 25% of his herd to the government and then we wanted to come by and tithe, he certainly wouldn't be counting every tenth one that he had to give to the government. So sounds to me like those folks that want you to tithe on your gross income uh, want you to rattle a little more coin in their plate. You've got to watch those. That's, you know, a man's uh, uh, real concerns are where his mind and heart is. And if that's all they think about is money, uh, you better watch them. Robert from Connecticut. What is the gift of tongues the Bible speaks of? The gift of tongues in God's Word has to do with the ability to speak multiple languages. That's, that's 
what the key is for tongues. Now, the language that the disciples spoke in Acts chapter 2, uh, the unique thing about it was that it could be understood by everyone who was there. And there were people there from all over the world. In other words, they all spoke almost every language in the world was represented there, and they all understood it. It was that cloven tongue of the Holy Spirit speaking that everyone understood. That's the key. If you ever hear someone speaking something that you don't understand, it's not that Pentecost tongue because uh, the key about it was that it could be understood. Catherine in Maine, in Genesis 3.15, can you please explain this verse? Uh, one of the first prophecies in God's Word, Genesis 3.15, uh, God is speaking to the serpent, uh, Satan, if you will, in the Garden of Eden after he beguiled Mother Eve and she conceived. And God told the serpent, I'm going to put enmity, that's difference, between your seed that's sperma, if you will, and the woman's seed. That's Eve's seed. And uh, it, meaning he, will bruise your head, uh, that being Jesus Christ, and you shall bruise his heel. And they certainly bruised his heel, the seed of the serpent, if, if you will, uh, Kenites, in other words, the sons of Cain, as they were responsible for the, the, the killing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When they drove those spikes through his ankles and his feet, they did bruise his heel. Uh, and the bruising of Satan's head is yet to come. That does happen uh, when our Lord and Savior returns, this time not as a babe in swaddling clothing, but as a king of kings and lord of lords riding on that white uh, war horse with that rod of iron for correction. There's going to be some correction. David in California, I heard Pastor Dennis teach that Christ went to the spirits in prison to preach to them as stated in 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. Dennis teaches in Numbers that Christ did this prior to his death on the cross. Could this have happened during Matthew 17, 2? If not, do you have a teaching on this subject? And David, I either misspoke or you misunderstood, but in no way have I ever intended to teach that Jesus Christ went to the prisoners uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3, and the correct scripture that you mentioned, before he was crucified. That happened after he was crucified. Uh, the first thing he did was he went to heaven and rent the veil uh, which separates us mortal men from God from top to bottom. But then soon after, uh, he went to the prisoners. Wanda in New Jersey. I heard that Cain's father uh, is the devil. Where would I be able to find that statement in the Bible? Well, you can find it in a lot of places, Wanda. Uh, Jesus taught it, uh, probably one of the more plainly and easily understood in John chapter 8, verse 44. And he tells those who are there in front of him, who are Kenites, that they are uh, the, the sons of the devil. You are of your father, the devil, Christ says there in John 8:44 a murderer from the beginning. Who was the first murderer? Cain slew his brother Abel. Uh, first epistle of John chapter 3 verse 12 also tells us that Cain was of that wicked one. Now let's see, who could the wicked one be? Well, you know, anyone with any uh, uh, knowledge of God's Word knows who the wicked one is. And if you, if you study the first six chapters of Genesis and take it back to the Hebrew, if you're not able to do that, do it with a teacher who's able to do that breakdown for you. And it's very apparent uh, what goes on. And some would say, well, Cain was Adam's son, not the serpent's son. That's not true. God's Word does not say that Cain was the son of Adam. They have two different genealogies. You'll find Cain's genealogy in Genesis chapter 4. 
You don't find Adam's genealogy until Genesis chapter 5, and, and read it for yourself. You will not find Cain there. And some would say, well, you don't find Abel there either, and that's correct. Uh, Abel was murdered before he was able to have any children, so uh, that's the reason Abel is left out of Adam's genealogy. Uh, Cain is left out because he had no business, that would have no business being there because Adam was not his father. Wanda in New Jersey, who was God talking to when he said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image? Can you explain who the us is? And of course, it's the angels, uh, his children, is who he was speaking to when he said that. A lot of questions about Genesis today. Paul in Virginia, is there a place in the Bible that gives a description of a dinosaur? We have fossils in museums that prove that the dinosaurs existed. Does God's Word talk about them? God's Word certainly does talk about them. In Job chapter 40, uh, they are called behemoth there. But you take a uh, first grader or second grader, and sit them down with paper and pencil and you read the description of behemoth to them and ask them to draw what you're reading and what you'll get is going to look a lot like a dinosaur. Why? Because that's where the dinosaurs were. Dinosaurs were in the flesh here on earth in the first earth age. Man was not in the flesh in the first earth age, but only in this, the second earth age. But the fossils we see, uh, which are responsible for the creation of the fossil fuels that, that we're so addicted to in this country, uh, are proof that the dinosaurs existed. Gwen in Kansas, my daughter was murdered last year at the age of 22. Is it wrong for me to want her murderers to get life in prison? Absolutely not. There's nothing wrong with you wanting and seeking justice uh, for the murder of your daughter. 22, that's, that's awfully young, and we're sorry for your loss, but don't you feel guilty whatsoever? Uh, and fact is, you know, if we went by God's law, uh, the murderers would get a whole lot worse than life in prison because God's law, Deuteronomy chapter 19, Numbers chapter 35, uh, tells us that capital punishment is what should happen when someone is convicted of premeditated murder. And uh, these responsible for your daughter's death, you know, they may have had their trial here on earth and they got life in prison, but uh, let me tell you, uh, Gwen, their real trial has yet to uh, transpire. That will come to pass uh, when they see their Heavenly Father for the first time. Kathy M. Missouri, where can I find in the Bible information on the different earth ages, and can you explain it a little because I want to explain it to my children? Well. You read about um, the first six chapters of Genesis uh, cover a lot to do, but again, you have to take it back to the Hebrew. Second uh, Peter chapter three, uh, verses one through seven talk about the three earth ages. Uh, and you know, this is a critical, critical study. Uh, every monthly newsletter that we send out on page three, you'll find a list of suggested CDs or tapes for new students, and Three World Ages, number 506 for tape or 30506 for CD, is on that list. And, and I can't help but believe, you know, Paul in the New Testament and his teachings often mention the mysteries of God. And one of the things that remains a mystery to most in this age are the Three World Ages. And, if you understand the, the three earth ages, it just opens up God's word and things start making sense. And, and so uh, if you're going to sit down and teach your children, my point, Kathy, I'd really recommend that you get a hold of a copy of that three world ages and, and go over that with your children. And they'll, they'll, they don't, a lot of people don't give children enough credit that, 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 that it's too complicated. That's not the case. Uh, we tend to make things more complicated than they are sometimes. So uh, just, just let it flow. Bonnie in California, 
Is the United States of America Babylon the Great that is in the book of Revelation? Absolutely not. Uh, only an imbecile would say that the United States of America is the great Babylon of Revelation. What does Babylon mean? It means confusion. And the United States, uh, uh, the home of many of God's uh, ten tribes that went north, over the Caucasus Mountains. This nation is blessed of God, uh, and believe me, he does not bless Babylon. Nita in Nebraska, I would like your opinion. I was told that Job was a parable or a story, that it wasn't actually real. Is this true? And I'm going to answer that the same way I answered the previous question. Only an imbecile would say that. Carla in Georgia, Will we be judged in the spirit or reward the flesh? And will the people who have lived right be judged? Leviticus 20, the great white throne judgment. We will be in spirit when we are judged. And yes, those who lived right or righteously will be judged. And what will they receive on judgment day? They'll receive rewards. All too many people think of Judgment Day as this terrible, terrible day. I look forward to Judgment Day. Why? Because we're judged for our works. And if you have righteous acts, you're going to receive rewards for them, not punishment. So don't think of judgment necessarily as all negative. There's going to be a lot of positive on Judgment Day. I would like to know, and this is from Howard in Mississippi, I would like to know what does it mean that there will be no more sea on the new earth. I thank you for your uh, time and research on this. You're welcome, Howard, and uh, we enjoy studying God's Word. Uh, and, and Howard, speaking of Revelation chapter 21, uh, as the earth is rejuvenated and God's throne comes to earth for the eternity. And there will be no more sea. And what are the seas? You've got to understand the symbology utilized in Revelation, or you'll never get the book of Revelation. Make a note, Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, and you'll find out what the waters are. The waters are the people. And the fact that there will be no more waters or people people, if you can make your conversion to the symbology, uh, and there will be no more flesh people after that time. Because why? Because all are in spirit bodies. Richard from Louisiana. Pastor Arnold, I ought to be ashamed knowing a lot about Father's Word, but this has me puzzled up. That's a new term to me, puzzled up. I'll, I'll, there's a lady who comes to broadcast from Louisiana. I'll have to ask her what puzzled up mean. I guess just puzzled will cover it. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works are therein shall be burned up. I understand you to say the earth will not burn up. Please explain this misunderstanding. Thank you and the staff for teaching God's Word where a child and me can understand. And you're sure welcome, Richard, and uh, we're, we're glad you enjoy studying the Word. And your confusion, I think, Richard, is that not everything is going to be burned up. I mean, the scripture you mentioned there, it states that the elements, which uh, if you check it out in your Strong's Concordance, it's the rudiments, the evil rudiments of the world are going to be destroyed because God is a consuming fire. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 will verify that. Uh, but you, if you serve God righteously, could be standing right next to someone who's evil, who's consumed with fire, and all you would feel is the warmth as the Holy Spirit of God touches your heart. So not all the... Why would God destroy the earth when he's going to return here for the eternity? And Revelation chapter 21 documents that fact. And uh, this is his favorite place in the universe. He's not going to destroy the earth. He is going to re renew it to its original, uh, uh, the way he, he created it. Thank God for that. 
Mary from Massachusetts, and thank you for your kind comments. Um, regarding our past lives in the first earth age, does our life now at all resemble what we were or what we did before in the last earth age? I love animals and love all the beauty of God's greenery on the earth. Did I love it then like I do now? Are we now as we were then? Okay, interesting question. And what did God say in Genesis chapter 1? He said, let us, to the angels, make God in our image. Boy, we have a lot of questions today on Genesis chapter 1. But, and that means that you were just like that then as you are now. That's, that's, that's what that all means there. So, uh, and I do believe though man was not in the flesh during the first earth age, uh, I do believe that there were spiritual beings of those who would be in the flesh in the second earth age who were free to roam earth. So it's very possible you enjoyed the greenery and, the, and God's creation in the first earth age. Probably will in the third earth age as well. And I'm out of time, so I better hold up on that question until our next broadcast. Uh, this hour seems like it just flies by, and I hope it's the same way for you. This book of Numbers is a little tough, but uh, hey, we're going to take a bite out of it each day and work our way through it. Things pick up real quick as they head out of the prom out of the from Mount Sinai toward the Promised Land. So be with us for that. I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. It makes His day when he looks down and he sees you seeking knowledge of him through the letter that he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.